We're here with Jen Fulweiler. I just saw her at City Winery. Jen, welcome to my show. Hello. How to be Tom Shalhoub. Starring Tom Shalhoub. You know, not everybody wants to be Tom Shalhoub. But for those people who do, I guess this podcast is for them. I mean, you got to model yourself after someone, right? Might as well be me, Tom Shalhoub. I am so excited to be on your show. This is a big honor. I'm a big fan. Oh, well, thank you. And I'm a big fan of yours. I mean, City Winery, New York City. I just went down there. I thought it was a certain place, but it was a different place because I think they closed and reopened in another spot. But how, how did you like playing New York? I, d- I liked it a lot. I'd actually been at that venue before. And you know how it is. It's nice when you go back to the same venue. You know the staff. You know the setup. Yeah. And um, I've done a few different places around there. And that was really nice. It had a- I thought it had a great atmosphere. Would you say that that's your crowd? Is the City Winery crowd? It's kind of like an upscale, isn't it? The, the, uh, it was the fellow who uh, opened up the show. He was kind of remarking on how nice everyone looked. He was surprised because I think he's used to a certain type of crowd in a comedy club. He was like, wow, everyone looks nice. You're we- you know, you're wearing <laughs> yeah, I've nice got the clothes. suburbanites, you know, well, I think it's not so much that they're, that they're an upscale crowd. They're a crowd who never gets to leave their house. This yeah. is their one date night in about 18 months. So they dress to the nines when they come out to comedy shows. This is their one chance. Right. Right. So, and it's kind of an upscale place. And I guess it, it's nice that we have, performance venues like that. I didn't know much about it. I, you know, I knew I had been to city winery. I had done some storytelling shows there in the past with the moth. And uh, I actually did a show. I opened up for a band there, uh, at, you know, kind of a music night, but it was kind of a classy establishment. I always thought, Oh, I'd like to get back there. And then, uh, my manager was saying, Hey, we're, we're talking to some city wineries around, you know, Philadelphia, uh, Boston, uh, about having you play city winery. And I said, I'm, I'm going to go down and check it out because Jen Fulweiler's playing. So I'm going to go see her show. So that's how it all came about. Um, and, well, uh, you well, know, can it I was nice to say, do you, do you know about the founding of it? No, but it's the, is it the living room or who's the guy who did it? Okay. It's, it's the guy. Um, so I actually met the founder. He came to one of my city winery shows and yeah. he was a New York city music guy and 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 he had this vision for bringing people together in kind of a living room type space but he yeah. has a genuine passion for supporting the performing arts and this yeah. is a he was a gazillionaire anyway before before he started city winery so this is really a passion project of his and by the way the way he ended up at one of my shows is i just dm'd him on Instagram, I'll DM billionaires, you know, nothing's going to stop yeah. me. I DM'd him and I said, uh, hey, I read your book and I liked it and I'm playing one of your venues and he came out to see the show. So. Oh, great. Yeah. So Michael Dorf, he's an American entrepreneur and native yes. of Milwaukee. He founded Knitting Factory. That's what it was. I, I said That's living what room. It was. But yeah, 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 yeah. So Knitting Factory. Uh, and then he founded City Winery, which I think was probably New York was the first one. And then he started mm-hmm. opening them all over the place. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so let's do your story, okay? I first okay. met you when you were, I don't know which book it was. But you've had, I think, three books. But you had written a book, and we went to the Union Club or the Yale Club, and that's where I met you. That's but, right. So you started as, as a, well, I mean, you didn't start as an author. I, give me the whole story. Well, I actually started as just a blogger because so I have six kids. I had six babies in eight years. So for many years, I I couldn't leave the house. I couldn't do anything. So I just had a blog, but I put a lot of passion into it. That led to book deals. The media surrounding the book deals led to Sirius XM finding me. So I was a radio host. That's it. It's funny, Tom. I turned them down a couple of times. I have emails where I said, look, radio is not for me. I'm just a writer. I, I don't do that verbal you know i just write on my computer that's all i do i turn them down 
And uh, Liz Aiello, one of the VPs of Talk There, flew down to Austin and basically said, I will not take no for an answer. So God wow. bless her. She changed my life. And uh, so she got me on the radio. And, and it, was, it was then that I'd been doing humor writing and humorous speeches for many years. And, and I realized that stand-up comedy is, it's similar to what I was doing, but it's sort of like the difference between an old fashioned and a shot of whiskey. <laughs> and I was like, let yeah. me go for the shot version of this. And then it, as soon as I discovered stand up, it, I just dropped everything else. I was like, this is all I want to do with my life. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I want to get to when you started stand up, but let's kind of go back in time to the serious XM. So you were kind of a mommy blogger. So what would you do? Get on there and be like, these kids are driving me crazy. And then you just kind of got <laughs> no. this mommy following. No, it actually, I didn't do a lot of mommy blogging in the sense of talking about kids or domestic stuff. I was undergoing a religious conversion. I was raised atheist and I was starting to think maybe I'm not an atheist anymore. So I was actually blogging more about theology yeah. and my adventures and mishaps, just trying to figure out what faith is. And um, so it was really more about that than about kid stuff per se. And then in my first book was ultimately about how I made that conversion process and, and all of that. Yeah. And so it was a, uh, essentially a religious blog. I thought it might've started with the, uh, you know, just having to have an outlet because, you know, with, with the kids and everything. Yeah. Um, that was, that was my outlet was to nerd out on theology because it's not a subject I'd ever thought about in my life. And so but writing about it was a way for me to just think through this, these profound mental shifts I was going through. Yeah, it's in, uh, now it's the premise of one of your bits, so I'm not going to mangle the bit, but essentially the premise being that you hope that there is a, that you get credit because people right. approach religion, uh, you know, in different ways. The most religious people I know are the converts. Uh, yeah. You know, at least in Catholicism, you know, the ones yeah. who converted and they know everything because as adults, they they learned everything and they paid attention in the yeah. way that like, you yeah, know, yeah. in in CCD class, we were kind of zoning out a little bit and maybe <laughs> we didn't learn everything. Right. So the converts know everything. So you're a convert. You learned everything. And you you what did you say? It, you said it in your act. You were talking about how it's not. um you know, sometimes it comes more from the head than the heart with you. Is that is that? Oh, a, a yeah, you know, thing? everyone these days is spiritual, but not religious. I'm religious, but not spiritual. And it <laughs> works really well for me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the idea that you, you know, maybe you'll get you'll get credit for all the. All right. The work right. Yeah. I, I hope God gives me credit for that. Like I can test out of some of the levels of getting into heaven because I'm not a great person, but I, I could pass any theological test. <laughs> I like that. So then you're on Sirius XM. And did you have to did you have to move or did you do it from a home studio or how did you do that show? Yeah, I was able to do it from a, from a home studio. So I stayed in Austin, Texas, and I did the show from a studio in Austin. And uh, yeah, I was live one to three p.m. Central every day. Yeah. And uh, it, it was a, it was a good job. I liked it. But it was a little bit difficult that my schedule was utterly inflexible. I was live 1 to 3 p.m. No yeah. matter how I felt, no matter what was going on in my life, I was just live. I'll, you know, so that that was a little bit it, it, it was all right, but a little bit of a challenge. I guess that would be the best time, that window, right? So what would you do? Yeah. Get up, you'd get all the kids in order and everything. And then you have this kind of window, two yeah. hours from one to three, and then it's back to chaos, right? Right. Because we homeschooled. So the kids didn't go off to school or anything. So we were able to kind of arrange our schedule around it. Oh, that's so funny. So the kids were, you know, you have school, there's certain classes where, you know, you have a teacher that you can kind of like flake off during their class, but it yeah. must have been from one to three, they must have been like, principal's gone. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It kind of was like that. I had to make sure stuff was done before I went on the air. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever have to dart out during commercial breaks or things like that? No, because it's Sirius XM. They hardly have any commercial breaks. It's, oh, yeah. We had three minutes at the top and then like two minutes in the middle of the hour. And that's it. They're, oh, I mean, yeah. You were just talking a lot when you're on Sirius XM. Yeah, because I used to do three hours a day on Fox oh, News Radio. Right. And that was there's a lot of breaks in commercial yeah. radio. And so, you know, you get used to being able to kind of get out of there every every, uh, you know, 12 to 15 minutes. And people used to say, how do you talk for three hours? It's really just about getting to the next break. Right, um, right. Yeah, it's in segments. It's segments. But did you also find that, because I used to listen to talk radio when I was, 
it just started in college. I would listen to Gene Burns in Boston. Then I started listening to uh, Curtis Sliwa when I came to New York. And then, of course, uh, Rush Limbaugh, De- Dennis Prager. I couldn't believe guys like Dennis Prager and Rush Limbaugh, how they could do a monologue when they open their show. And I say, this guy talks every day for 20 minutes. You know, yeah. who does that? Yeah. And I couldn't even believe it. And then once I started radio, you know, it, it, for the first week or two, you're kind of filling time. But then it becomes quite easy and natural, doesn't it? Yeah. Then you run out of time. That became my issue. I, I was like, I need more than two hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So uh, you probably have the worst time in the world. You decided to start touring stand up. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, in in 2019, I knew I wanted to tour, but I was unrepresented, didn't have a manager, didn't have an agent. I called comedy clubs. They didn't know who I was. They wouldn't book me. I had some fans from Sirius XM. Now, I didn't know if these fans cared about me doing stand up, but I'd been working hard at it. I'd um, <laughs> because I, I spent a lot of time working out my comedy in the clubs in Austin, but I couldn't do it seven nights a week like some comics could. Yeah. So I actually created a, a spreadsheet where I put the hour that I was working on in a spreadsheet and then would rate the laugh level and the response. And, and I would correlate that with the demographic of the crowd. And so I tried to get really accurate data well, in a spreadsheet. Wait a minute. Let me try to picture that because I'm, yeah. I'm looking at it's like in an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, I have so, it right here. Hang, hang on. I can pull it up in a second if I can find my phone. Yeah, it's yeah. It's I want to know what Excel the columns spreadsheet. look like. So you've got what the bit is it, the, the, yeah. the the comedy idea. Yeah. And yeah. you would what are the factors that you put into it? The the age okay, I of put, the audience? So, yeah. OK, so each bit is listed and then the laugh level so i'm looking for my phone here so i can show it to you the yeah. laugh level is uh that would be rated but then i also uh measured the time in between laughs because again i was trying to work on a really solid hour and then yeah. and i had all of this conditionally formatted so red was good and gray was bad and so when you scan down these columns <laughs> uh you could see red to yellow to gray. And so, for example, I, I sort of hadn't realized there was a part of my set where I, I went a pretty long time without an A laugh. It was like a lot of gray and yellow. Yeah. And I realized, yeah, that that doesn't I've got I've got to fix something. I have to add something there because that, that's just too much gray and yellow in that part of the hour. And, you know, I came up with a pretty solid hour straight out of the gate. And it only took six to eight months, mainly because of the spreadsheet. Of course, it was working it out in the clubs, but um, the spreadsheet really it kind of cut my time in half. I mean, it was it was very helpful. Yeah, I mean, you, you can really make it work. I used to teach stand up through the pit here in New York, and I would s- say to the students, you've got to get up there and do the stage time because that's what everyone always says: get up, get your stage yeah. time, run yep. your jokes. But you can definitely accelerate the process with little tricks. Uh, right. I didn't have that kind of uh, you know analysis with the spreadsheet, but I would always do this. This was something I did from the very beginning. And I don't really do it anymore. But I tell everyone else to do it, especially when they're just starting out is record your act, and then write it out word for word. So it's recording, and then sit down and take the time to don't, you know, don't look at your notes, write down exactly what you said, it has to be a transcription of every um and ah and everything that you say. So you write the whole thing out. And then wherever you get a laugh, just either highlight it or underline it in red. I I used to use a red kind of, uh, you know, crayon type marker or waxy red mark uh, pencil. And I would just underline the laughs in red. And if it was a huge laugh, I would give two lines. You know, that was it. And then you would look down the page and wherever there wasn't any red, I would think, okay, we've got to do something with that section. Reduce it, you know. So it, it was analysis. I don't think I went as far as you, but that can really cut your time down in develop and uh, developing material. I think uh, I would say it also improves it because I actually just did that for my current hour. It took forever, but I hand typed it just like I was performing it uh, on stage and ideas came to me because you're using a whole different part of your brain when you're writing as opposed to speaking and performing. Yeah. And I thought I got a lot of great little tags and funny twists saying a different word that was funnier through that process of writing it down. And it, you know, it was very painstaking and it, it took a while, but I'm so glad I did it. Cause yeah, that's very helpful. 
Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your worst timing in the world uh, for a career change experience. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I decided after I'd been at Sirius XM many years. Uh, so I booked my first comedy tour with my personal credit card. I forgot to finish that. So yeah. So no, when you I said that on stage, huh? you said that on stage. The interesting thing about yeah. your act is you, you kind of talk about things that most people don't talk about. I mean, the idea yeah. that you were doing your stand up act and you were telling people that you financed your first tour on your credit card. And I said, this mm -hmm. is so fun. I can't wait to talk to her about this when we do the podcast. But what does that mean? What did you do with your credit card? What kind of things were you paying for? Get this. I, uh, my best friend and I cold called theaters. So I would pull up Google Maps and I would, in Google Maps, I would do, so I'd pull up the city of Columbus, let's say Columbus, Ohio, yeah. and I would type in rent theater. And then it would show me just geographically where theaters were that I could rent. So I could kind of tell what's a good part of town, bad part of town. You can sort of guess by what other establishments are around there. And um, <laughs> so uh, I would cold call theaters and say, can I rent your venue for a performance? <laughs> and sometimes they thought it was a prank caller because not a lot of people rent theaters just themselves for a private performance. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but they did. And I did. I did a tour. It was basically all Monday and Tuesday nights because you can get the theaters half price. So I paid a lump sum to just rent out the theater. And and then I kept 100 percent of the door. Wow. So basically, I would have been in bankruptcy if I hadn't sold tickets. Yeah. Um, but we put together 13 theaters across the country and all but two sold out. And the ones that didn't sell out, they were like 80, 90 percent. They were close. Um, and I went all over the country and I brought my kids to be tour manager. I didn't bring every kid to every tour stop, but it was usually two per show. Yeah. And uh, I had a great local gal who does comedy and she was willing to come and not only open, but be my tour manager and my assistant and all sorts Somebody of stuff. Somebody from Austin. It Huh? Someone from Austin. Yeah, someone from Austin. Um, she was, you know, she was young, twenty five. It, it was all an adventure for her. I wildly underpaid her, but uh, but she thought it was fun. And the two of us and my kids would just go all over to the country. So I would show up in a city I'd never been to at a theater that I hoped actually existed that I had just rented on a Monday night. You know, put my credit card down. But stuff would happen. Like I found out I had to get event insurance. I had to. Yeah. higher security i mean there was it was a thousand times more complicated than i thought it would be it's like fire don't you have to have the fire department in there to inspect or have, do you have to get a bond or something no they never made me do that just event insurance what's funny is i had to personally sign a waiver that said or not a waiver but i had to sign something that said there will be no drag races there will be no flame throwing and no bull riding at my shows How and i you... thought that gives me some ideas though. I mean, I might want this. I should, I sign this. Maybe there should be bull riding at my shows. This is a great idea. I know. Like what if they had in the, somebody's drag racing at a theater. It doesn't make sense. Uh, right. I know. Right. <laughs> in the parking lot, maybe with our minivans. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but what made you, uh, everybody loves playing a theater. I love having that nice theater crowd, yeah. you know, but what made you go theaters? Why not just call the comedy clubs, let them book you in the club, they can sell drinks. You're not taking any risk because the club is going to have you in there. And then if it's a, if it's a bust, you're not going to make money, but you're not going to go uh, go into debt. The clubs wouldn't return my phone calls. I tried so many. I tried probably six or seven clubs. It's funny that I've now yeah. gone back and you know sold yeah. out, but they none of them, not one of them, got back to me. No that clubs would incredible. return my phone calls. Has yeah. anyone else done this? I mean, comics <laughs> get out there and they work the club circuit, and then. Yeah. Once they get a following, some of them are able to move to theaters. I've been doing kind of a combination of, of both of them. I'll go to a comedy club. I'm going to be coming down to Texas, so I'm going to be playing Hyenas. Oh, uh, nice. And, uh, but then I'm going to be playing uh, Zelka Hall, which is in the Hobby Center. Yeah. And that's a nice theater. You yeah. Know? Oh, so that's nice. Yeah. I got to really work on the tickets for my Houston show. But Dallas, it, it shouldn't be a problem. Hyenas. Yeah selling out yeah. that room i'm probably going to add a second show so i like trying to do the combination of it but do you know anyone else who started in theaters because they couldn't crack into the comedy club circuit because they wouldn't get their calls returned yeah i i've never heard of it and interestingly that's how i ended up with great representation i'm with uta now and the the people who signed me at uta said 
we've never really seen anyone bet on themselves <laughs> on the yeah. level that you did. And yeah. of course, they liked my comedy too. They, I got a special filmed as part of this because when you do something crazy, people hear about it and word yeah. got around and there was a video production company that they said, and they're top quality. And they said, hey, we've never done a comedy special. We'd love to do something like that. So they did a deal. It, if I had paid for this, it would have been a six figure filming. It was eight yeah. cameras, 4K, unbelievable and uh but they did it on i'll i just gave the proceeds whatever proceeds i made later but they did it for free and um and i we ended up at 800 pound gorilla the record label took it over and we got it on amazon and all that but it was they just offered to come down to this theater and film it so so i got a great special out of the tour as well but yeah U, uta said they said you know you bet on yourself you prove the concept and so now I'm with them. But what's funny is because most people don't go from theaters to clubs, yeah. I had to learn things like crowd work. I, yeah. I had to, it, as you know, you perform a little differently in a theater versus a club. Yeah. And so I actually had to go through the learning curve of clubs after I had kind of mastered theaters. Wow. So the... I don't think they the the people who are listening understand what I was talking about the timing right because we got into all the issues with the uh, with the oh, theaters, yeah. but you so was the the tour the first tour you did was that uh, while you still worked at uh, Sirius XM. Yes. So I okay. was still at Sirius XM during that, and then when it worked, that's what you were leading up to. I said, yes. you know what, this is this is an income generator. I can do this, and uh, so I resigned. At Sirius XM, I turned in my resignation and we planned for me to finish out a couple extra months. And uh, this was in March of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I think I'll quit my stable job yeah. uh, that, you know, is a good salary, provide benefits for my whole family. And uh, yeah, I think I'll quit that to do stand up comedy touring in March of 2020. And my husband had taken a big step back from his work, because with six kids, we, we can't both work all the time. And yeah. he'd taken a big step back from what he was doing. So it was that that was that was pretty dicey when <laughs> the pandemic. That was pretty rough timing. Well, it's interesting. So you say March of 2020. So we were kind of already in the thick of the hysteria, but it wasn't appearing that people were going to actually shut the world down right when did they really right. shut it down was it like a month later or oh i remember very clearly because when i told my bosses i was quitting we were hearing about COVID, and remember the two weeks to flatten the curve it was that so it was like yeah all right two weeks well good this will give me some time to catch up on a few things and so yeah by the time i actually had my last day on the air which was made it was full lockdown and it was clear that there was no end in sight, that <laughs> those were not good times. Did you think about saying just kidding or was it you, you had already kind of like committed to this? You know, you I think once tour, you right? check out of a job, yeah. you can't check back in. And no, I never I actually never looked back. It oddly enough, it it still felt right, even though it kind of sent my life into chaos. It mm -hmm. it it still felt right. I felt like my time on radio was done. And I don't think I could have checked back into that job, even if I wanted to. Yeah. And then did you what did you do during the the lunacy that was those few years? So I just started making videos. You know, I couldn't get stand up clips. So I did little sketches and little videos. And and a lot of them went really viral. I got I got I got 30,000 TikTok followers in one week, one time from my little videos. So I just wow. started in, investing in my in my fan base that way and then i spent a lot of time on my podcast and i have a patreon you know patreon can be a great income source for people with podcasts so i focused on the patreon and my podcast and just trying to get my videos to go viral basically yeah and so it was podcast patreon uh tiktok whatever other things you know when you shoot the videos do you do you post them on everything or do you shoot a different video for a different kind of uh platforms i was too lazy to do different platforms so yeah. i just did one video and i put it everywhere yeah it's funny because certain kind of things work though i i feel like you know you make a video and it, it works on instagram but maybe right. not on facebook or something like that you know i very much saw that very platform dependent something would get 8 million views on TikTok and it would get 30,000 views on Instagram. Exact same video, same caption, same hashtags. It's very platform dependent. Yeah. So 
you started it on your own. Then the industry came to you. <laughs> now you've got your really a mainstream, uh, you know, UTA, you said, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what do they think about your your Catholic world? I mean, you're following us from the, the Catholic world, you know, uh, and do they see you as, do they see you as mainstream? Do they want to try to move you out of that? And like, hey, you know, I know you got your Catholic world, but no, now you got to go Hollywood. <laughs> well, they yeah, they definitely want me to go mainstream. And we're very aligned on that. That, um, you know, I think what you've done, what Gaffigan has done, that I like that model of no one's hiding what their background is, but yeah. I, that that's not my primary, that's not the main thing I'm up there to talk about is Catholic references and being Catholic stuff. Um, so it, it's a part of who I am. But yeah, UTA and I both, we, we very much would like to just reach much more of a general audience. And, um, and, and I, and, you know, that's also just, where you know where my passion is and but having the sort of catholic background they're they're very respectful of it they're very fine with it i think because you know in comedy you really need to be a character you need to be a little bit of kind of a stereotype and so i think having those things about yourself that stand out that you know i'm this atheist to catholic convert it doesn't matter what faith you believe in if you know the comedy industry you know okay that's a memorable character i I wouldn't forget that background because that's unique. And, and I think that's kind of how they see it. It's, it's kind of marketable in that sense. Yeah. And do you have trouble um, with, you know, I, I remember you said you, you, you had uh, one of your, your opener, your feature act was going to be late to the show the other day. So you were like, I need a clean comic. I mean, you need yeah. a certain type of comic because your audience, you have a bunch of Catholic people. There's a lot of, uh, you know, low down stuff that goes on in comedy clubs. <laughs> and so, I mean, you, you must have to look out for that, right? Oh, absolutely. And it's a, it's a really big challenge because you know that different people have different ideas of what is clean. Yeah. And for, well, for example, if you're performing at a Baptist church, you would not want to reference drinking at all. Whereas it, if you're performing for a group of Catholics, I mean, they're all drunk while you're performing. You can definitely reference alcohol. You're having but a good they, time. You know, so yeah, clean comedy means different things to different people. And so when I choose openers, I do need to find people who just get what my brand of clean means. It's not Bible study, perfect, squeaky, clean, but but they do need to understand kind of where those limits are. Yeah, I found that because I have... Uh... You know, I was just in San Francisco. I, I said, a local opener is fine. And, and then I said, just find somebody clean. And then they come and they kind of want to go over what what they can do in, in their set before you. And I think a lot of people think that se like lots of sex talk is clean. As long as, right. as, long yeah. as they're not swearing. Like right. I you wouldn't mind swears, like general cursing. Right. As much as people going into details about their girlfriend, it's gross. You know, I, I don't want to talk about that. I've had that happen more than a few times that they walk off on stage like, oh, great, clean set. I knew I could do it. And I'm like, you gave us visuals about certain parts of your anatomy yeah. that none of us can unsee now. Yeah. That was so disgusting. And they're like, I did a great job because I didn't drop an F-bomb. <laughs> like, oh, I oh. know. <laughs> and, you know, we've all heard we've heard the language. It's just yeah. the idea yeah, yeah. of, uh, you know, so that's great. What's what's coming up now? Uh, you know, what's happening? What, what What's next? Yeah, what's next is filming my next special. I mean, I've only released one special because I, I had the one that came out. It came out during COVID, just exactly what you want. November of 2020, promotion was like such a nightmare. Oh, um, it, so and, it, wait a minute. When did you shoot it then? Uh, I shot it September of 2019. Okay, so you had it done before the hysteria. Yeah, And yeah, then yeah. it was released, but maybe it was kind of good. People were People were inside streaming things at that time. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's true. It did well. So, I mean, I was happy with I wished, obviously, that I could have toured to support it. But um, but it, it did well. 800 Pound Gorilla did a great job with it. Amazon Prime. The Amazon Prime actually posted videos on their TikTok and didn't even tell us they were going to do that. We we were surprised to see it. But yeah, that did well. Oh, so um, it wasn't net, I was saying Netflix. Did I say it earlier? I oh, was it was. Someone, I saw your Netflix special, but I saw it on Amazon. Is that right? It was on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get mixed so, up because it's all the, you know, I just, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know where I've seen things. 
Yeah, and those are kind of the two big ones, it seems like, right now. Um, so, But that was, I haven't released a special since then because by the time I signed with UTA, then they got me set up with a great manager. I just adore my manager. He's so good. But I didn't sign with him until basically 2022 by the time we got everything up and running. Yeah. And he's really been giving me some pretty tough feedback about my material in a good way. He's saying, you know, let's make your next special top quality. Let's have it really make a splash. So it's been about a year and a half of I send him tape and I send him tape and I send him tape and he writes up all these really brutal notes and then I go, you know, uh, take that feedback. So my material is just now at the point where he and I agree it's, it's something special. It's, it's, it's really solid. And so, um, So the next step for me is obviously I'm on tour right now. It's called the maternal instinct tour, going to a bunch of fun places. And uh, at the end of it, we're we're not actually sure where yet, but um, I'll be filming a special finally. And I'm so excited about that. So you're not sure where, but it's going to be around when are you planning to shoot? (laughs) Probably like eight weeks from now, Tom. This is how I roll. This is kind of all coming together at the last minute, but I I don't have a venue or a date. (laughs) Yeah, this is amazing, really. I mean, it, it, you know, uh, because everything has been – when I started stand-up, there was a way to do things, you know? Yeah. Now that way, totally blown up. Obviously, I know because I'll be doing a comedy club, and the next person – you know, I look up who's headlining after me, and it's somebody who was either a TikTok person or uh, they, if they get a YouTube following – They've got it all different ways. Some of them are just kind of, they have a lot of Facebook friends and they can fill a comedy club. And uh, so the way that it used to be done, you would move to a city like New York or LA, you know, or you'd stay in Boston or, or Cleveland or wherever, and you'd work the club circuit there, hoping to then get big enough so you could move to New York and get on those kind of bigger stages. Then you would get somebody who could, who was, uh, had connections to look at you for a late night show. You do your four and a half minutes set on uh, late night. Uh, maybe you'd get an agent then. Maybe you'd start touring based on your late night. There was a way that it was done. It's not done that way anymore. So you have to right. just kind of make all it up. Blown up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But and, go- and I think that that works well for me just since, you know, having my just being a stay at home mom with a blog. Uh, all I've ever known is making things happen on my own. I that's that's my whole background. So I'm comfortable with just you know, you just got to slog it out and be scrappy and make things happen. Yeah. So the the last special you shot, your first special, the production company wanted to shoot it and it didn't seem like there was a plan for because you didn't have a distributor yet. And I don't even think you were with your agent, right? No, no, I'm no. still totally unrepresented. Yeah. So they blew the money on this thing and it could have been a massive loss for them, but they wanted to take the risk. Yes. Yeah. Correct. And, and I told them, I said, look, we we have no idea what the result of this will be. And and they're just really great, great guys. Spirit Juice is the name of the company. They're wonderful. They said, we would like to have the experience. So we gained something to just have our name on a comedy special. They'd seen my material. They knew they liked it. And they said, we'd be proud to have our name associated with this even mm-hmm. if it's it's a loss for us. And uh, it's and it's beautiful. I mean, that's special. It looks you, great. I think that's why everyone thinks it's Netflix, because it looks like it's Netflix. Well, it's not only it not only looks good and it sounds good. It's very, you know, professional in a, you know, kind of a high def way or whatever. But it's well directed. So who directed it? Did they hire somebody who was used to directing st- stand up comedy specials? No, the owner of the company, this guy, Rob Kazmark, he uh-huh. just studied directing comedy specials and he yeah. spent months on it leading up to it and uh he he just taught himself how to direct it he's just a buddy of mine who said hey how hard can it be i'll learn how to direct a comedy special yeah that's interesting because when i was doing comedy central i think it was rick mill productions uh and they had that windmill as their logo. They oh, were always yeah, yeah. the best at yeah. shooting those things. Like if you if you were going to do a Comedy Central special, uh, Comedy Central special, you knew it was in good hands because these guys, Rick Mill, they would yep. shoot everything. And yep. but then you would see someone who kind of went off on their own and shot their own special, and you could kind of you could always tell, you know. Right. Um, but with yours, it wasn't that way. So obviously, this guy did his homework. Oh, he absolutely did. They studied how to edit it. I mean, he he wanted to learn how to do comedy specials and he very much did. It's funny, though, if you look at the IMDb that, you know, you don't recognize the names, but it's just me and my buddy who runs his film company and some friends of mine who helped out. I mean, that is the IMDb credits. These are just my friends. These are just the people yeah. on my phone. There's no industry. There is not one comedy industry person who was even within three degrees of separation 
of anyone on that IMDb. Wow. And the company is Spirit. What did it say? Spirit Juice? Spirit Juice is the name of it. They're so good. Is it? Is there a religious connection there? It sounds like they might be They've religious. They've done Catholic stuff in the past. I, I don't know what they're doing now, but I think that is how they got their start. Mm-hmm. Um, also, and your manager, he's got silver linings. I wondered if he's a, you know, religious guy, there seems to be some signaling in there. Is that, is that, no, is that, I don't want to get, you know. No. And, and I think he's independent now, Tigerman management. So his name is Reg Tigerman yeah. and no, he doesn't have yeah. a faith. I mean, I don't know what his personal beliefs are, but no, he yeah. was, he was with levity for a long time and he's, um, he's a levity guy. Yeah. I mean, not right. currently, so but he's, yeah. For people who don't know, Levity, I mean, they've been in the business for years and they they are managers, but they also run, I mean, comedy rooms and everything else. Right. So he came out of that world. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. he's honestly he's the best manager I could have ever asked for. He has incredible experience. He's also a family man. So he understands he gets my life, the, the balance that I try to do. Yeah. And um, but yeah, he has a ton of experience. This is great. So I'm not doing uh, you. Are you still in Austin? Yes, or are you yeah. kind of out, out of the city, but you're kind of a bit of suburbs, right? But you're suburbs. still in the Austin. Yeah, yeah. Area. I'm in Round Rock, which is north of Austin. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to be in Austin, but I am going to be down there in October. Like I said, I'm going to be at Hyenas. I don't know if you've ever played, played there in uh, in uh, Fort Worth. Yes, I, ha I haven't yet, I'm but I hear great doing, things. And the, yeah, the uh, and then the Hobby Center in Houston. I noticed right. you were at... Um, Where's the San Antonio room you're playing? It looks quite nice. It's a nice the Tobin theater Center. there in San Antonio. Yeah, Tobin yeah, Center. Tobin Center. Beautiful. Yeah, I love the Tobin Center. Gorgeous. And you've done it before, and it's coming up yes. again? Yes. Yeah, I did yeah. it last time I was in San Antonio. Yeah, we sold out that room there, and it was so nice. San Antonio is great, and I want to get there, but it's not part of my current thing. So uh, hopefully we'll be down there. So maybe uh, I'll let you know when I'm coming to Austin. I got to get down yes. there because there's a lot going on down there. And I know you played the Creek in the Cave, Rebecca, who oh, yeah. used to be here in New York. Yes. And I was just, you know, rubbing two sticks together. I used to play the Creek in the Cave in Queens. Oh, so wow. she's now down there in Austin. Yep. Um, and Rogan's there. Obviously, he's got the comedy mothership. So it's kind of a comedy town now. Oh, it is. I mean, you can walk from Creek in the Cave. It's about four blocks to Mothership, one block to Sunset Strip. And uh, and then there are, you know, there's Cap City, which is more up north. That's more like they get the suburban crowd. Well, they get everyone, but certainly the suburban crowd because they're up north in a nice uh, shopping area there. And and we have East Side Comedy Club. And then there's so many bar shows. I mean, there there are five or six shows a night in Austin at this point. It's really becoming yeah. a pretty intense comedy city. Yeah, I think in the old days, comedians used to move to Cleveland because they wanted to be in that area where they oh, could kind of play yeah. Chicago, New York and Boston, you know. So it was this kind of triangle that a lot of comedians lived in. Now there's a bit of an orbit around uh, Austin, I think because of Rogan, people just kind of want to be down there in that in that city. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you you really yeah. see that. And it was also. Uh, just it was Rogan, but it was also just generally during COVID. Texas was a little more a little more loose with when we could start doing shows. So yeah. you had this mass exodus of comedians from L.A. and New York who just wanted stage time. So they planned to come down here only temporarily and they stayed. And it, it's the best thing that could have happened to Austin comedy. We had a we had a really nice comedy scene before COVID, but we needed some competition, to be honest. It was a little bit of a. We were all kind of talking to each other at the same bar shows. We needed that infusion of people from L.A. and New York to, to bring in a little bit of healthy competition. Yeah, I remember during COVID, Gutfeld and I were doing live shows and we did a lot in Texas. We did Midland. We did Dallas area. We did Austin and Houston. Yep. But we had to do the outdoor shows. Yeah, uh, because people would come and sit in the parking lot and they would get, you know, kind of do a, a you know, tailgating and we would do the yeah. show outside. But they were totally laid back. People just came and drank beer and sat outside. When we did the outdoor shows in Massachusetts, those lunatics made people wear masks outside. Outside? Yeah, we were on Cape Cod with this like sea breeze blowing over everyone. And the, oh they had the COVID police running around making everyone wear their stupid masks on Cape Cod. It was wow. Totally, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And outdoor shows are tough anyway, even when people aren't aren't wearing masks. Yeah. Crazy. Um, it was at an outdoor. It was at a the one in Cape Cod was a like a drive in movie theater. 
and they converted, oh. but yeah, it was, it was bad. Those were, I, I, I mean, I, I, I never stopped talking about how ridiculous that period in it our was lives wild. was, but well, anyway, this was great fun. Your show was great fun the other night and uh, we'll have to do it again soon. Absolutely. And let's connect uh, off the air, so to speak, about when you're in Houston and Dallas. That's a pretty easy drive for me. So I'd love to come out and check out your show if at all possible. Yes. Oh, and let me give a shout out to Lisa Katasik. You know, you talked about having stalkers, right? She's one of your stalkers, isn't she? Well, she's welcome to be. I stalk Lisa. She's so great. We kind of stalk each other. <laughs> she bought me tickets to your show. That's why I want to give her the shout out. Yeah. I didn't want her to. I yeah. wanted her to give me your number. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, give me your, give me, <laughs> yeah. Uh, give me Jen's phone number because I want her to do my podcast. Yeah. And then I said, and I think I'm going to go see her at the uh, city winery. And then a couple of tickets pop up on my phone. She bought the tickets already. And I said, stop buying things. Knock it off. <laughs> so funny. And she said, I might come up. I might get on a plane and fly. I said, don't get on a plane. Stop it. And then when you mentioned <laughs> the stalkers, I said, oh, yeah, you got one so with Lisa Katastic. Anyway, <laughs> she's so, so thank wonderful. you. Thank you, Lisa, for the tickets. <laughs> um, and, uh, good. We, we will talk soon. I never know how to end these, so we'll just say goodbye and then I'll click a little red button. Okay. All right. Sounds good. See you, Jen.